Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and today I am excited to chat about all of the things that I read and watched for Jane Austen July this year. I had a fantastic Jane Austen July this year, the highlight of which was definitely having my husband Andy read his first Jane Austen novel ever. And not only did he read Pride and Prejudice, but he liked it and agreed to discuss it with me on this channel. So we filmed a whole video about that, and I highly recommend taking a peek at it if you haven't already. Andy had so many interesting insights into Pride and Prejudice, more even than made it into the video, and I had a blast discussing it with him throughout the month. And even though the month has passed, we are currently watching the 1995 BBC adaptation and chatting about it as well, which is amazing. I hope we keep up this momentum of discussing bookish things together because I've been enjoying it immensely. I'm thinking of doing a little Q&A type video with him on the channel in the future, so if there are any specific questions that you want him to answer, bookish or otherwise, I suppose, please let me know in the comments. But now on to my reading for Jane Austen July. I read more than I thought that I could with an infant, but still less than I had hoped for. The first book that I finished for Jane Austen July was Northanger Abbey. It was probably the fourth or fifth read for me, and I really enjoyed it. Northanger isn't my favorite Austen novel, but I do think that it's wonderful and severely underrated. I spoke about Northanger Abbey in detail on my Jane Austen July vlog, um, but I'll discuss it a bit here as well. On this read, I paid more attention to the role of Mrs. Allen in the text. I found her genuinely funny on this read, the way she is so obsessed with fashion to the point of neglecting to pay proper attention to so much around her, including Catherine. And when she does pay any semblance of attention to Catherine, it's all about fashion and dress anyway, sometimes to Catherine's benefit, like getting her a new wardrobe and bath, and sometimes to her detriment. Mrs. Allen is just such a narrow-minded character, and that makes her really hysterical sometimes. On this read, I also felt that Catherine was not as naive a character as I remember her to be. Catherine is described as little in the habit of judging for herself, and that's her real problem, rather than naivete. She trusts her brother and his judgment so much so that she allows herself to be misled when it comes to the Thorpes, despite the validity of her own intuition. And then when it comes to General Tilney, she allows her experience with Gothic novels to guide her to a fault. I love the book's discussion of novels and literature in general. In some ways, it serves as an allegory that novels must be reflected on and interpreted. Austen places her writing between these two extremes of the gothic novel and nonfiction as stories that are heavily grounded in reality. And she muses on what that means exactly for the art form. Like the gothic novel, her works are stories, they're fiction, and they're entertaining, but her defense of the novel is that they can be just as valuable as nonfiction books, especially if they're thought about critically and interpreted, because through them we get a real glimpse into human nature and a lens with which to view the world around us. I find that Northanger's plot and characters are generally pretty simple compared to Austen's other works, but Northanger has complex thoughts about the novel as an art form. It was a real joy to reread this one. So if you joined along with the group read this July, I would love to know what you paid special attention to in Northanger Abbey this year. I also read Jane Austen's Juvenalia, which was a real treat. I hadn't read most of it before, and I was astounded by how funny and absurd they all were. They are playful in every sense of the word, full of exaggerations and parodies, familial inside jokes, sarcasm and irony. I was surprised by how Austen pushes the boundaries of polite society, and features all sorts of impropriety, from theft to imprisonment to drunkenness and assault. People simply do not adhere to the conventions of their social class. It's this topsy-turvy world that Jane explores in her juvenilia. And I get the sense that she's pushing boundaries in order to explore and make better sense of her world. She does the same thing with her writing form as she does with its content. Like 
the beautiful Cassandra is subtitled a novel in 12 chapters, but each chapter is only a sentence long. And she experiments with plays and poetry and the epistolary form too. It's all very playful and I think that this kind of experimentation is what led her to find her calling with the novel and to develop the method of free indirect discourse that she does so beautifully. It was just so much fun to read these and I feel like I'm still processing how exactly they fit together um, or what exactly the relationship is with her later works. This month I also read The Murder of Mr. Wickham by Claudia Gray. This book surprised me with how wonderful it was. I was looking for something light and fun and Austin related of course, and it was, but it was also very carefully and consciously written and quite thought-provoking. The premise is that Emma is hosting a house party at Donwell Abbey, and the main Austin heroes and heroines that get married in the books are pretty much all in attendance, with a few exceptions, and two of their children are there as well, Jonathan Darcy and Juliet Tilney. Mr. Wickham comes to crash the house party and is murdered, so Jonathan Darcy and Juliet Tilney take it upon themselves to play detective and uncover the murderer. It's like Agatha Christie meets Jane Austen, and I think both authors would wholly approve. I was amazed by how Claudia Gray managed to recreate believable Austen characters. It's so hard to write someone else's characters convincingly for a spin-off like this, while retaining their authenticity, but these depictions really felt like Austen's heroes and heroines to me, or at least Austen's characters with a little age and experience. There were a few characters who Grey interpreted slightly differently than I would have from reading Austen, but her interpretations are plausible and within the realm of valid possibility. Like I personally wouldn't have written Captain Wentworth the way Claudia Gray did, as so ambitious and prideful, but I see where she pulled that inspiration from, and it still worked to some degree. And I didn't love her interpretation of Fanny because in Mansfield Park, Fanny does question Edmund at times, um, but Claudia Gray wrote Fanny as if she's never questioned anyone in her life, but my favorite characterizations were of the Darcys. I spend a great deal of time thinking about what Elizabeth's marriage looks like after the events of Pride and Prejudice, and I found this interpretation fascinating. I also really enjoyed Claudia Gray's examination of Elizabeth's relationship with Mary Bennett. And then maybe actually my favorite characters were the ones that Gray wrote herself. Jonathan Darcy is an impeccably drawn character. He's written as neurodivergent in some ways, possibly autistic, and it's interesting to see how he navigates society and to compare him to Fitzwilliam Darcy. In some ways, he follows his father's character arc of having lots of ladies throwing themselves at him for his wealth and his estate rather than his person. But Jonathan also has his own story, and I really enjoyed watching it unfold. And Juliet, to me, seems like a really interesting mashup of Elizabeth Bennet and Catherine Moreland. Like Catherine, she's thrust into society with quite loose chaperoning. In this case, Emma is supposed to be her chaperone, but there are hardly any societal guidelines on how to conduct yourself in the event of murder. And so Emma has her hands full trying to keep the house party calm and collected and entertained. I also loved how the author invented connections between the characters as to how they all knew Emma and would be invited to Donwell, as well as how they all knew Wickham. For some people, the whole premise of the book might seem too convenient or contrived, but I thought that Gray did a really good job of giving informed and plausible and interesting explanations and backgrounds for everyone involved. When reading this book, I was a tad nervous for the ending because I didn't want to imagine that any of my beloved Austen characters could be capable of committing murder. And it's just so out of character for all of them, really. But I was even more afraid that it would be a Murder on the Orient Express type ending. Anyway, the ending, which I'm not going to spoil for you, was quite satisfying, and it was explained by everyone acting quite in character, actually. I highly recommend this book. It's one of my new favorite Austin-adjacent books. And there's a sequel, too, which I've heard even better things about. It's called The Late Mrs. Willoughby. 
and part of me wants to pick it up right away and part of me wants to wait until I reread Sense and Sensibility because it's been a while since I read it and I want to remind myself all about Willoughby first. This month I also listened to The School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan on audiobook and I really enjoyed this one actually. I don't usually enjoy the challenge to read Jane Austen's contemporaries. I don't find other novels from the time period that exciting, but this is a play and I absolutely loved it. It's a comedy of manners and has been compared with some of my other favorite plays like The Importance of Being Earnest and Pygmalion. School for Scandal is full of hypocritical gossips and love triangles and adultery. I love the character names too. There is Sir Peter Teasel and Lady Sneerwell, which are especially good. The whole thing is a real riot, and it's definitely a play that Austen was familiar with. She even played Mrs. Candor, another great name, in a private theatrical. A book that I started but unfortunately did not finish in July, which also has everything to do with Jane Austen and the theater, was The Genius of Jane Austen by Paula Byrne. I am, or was, loving this book. I'm not sure if I'm still reading it. It's just so interesting, but it's a little dense, and I felt like I wasn't absorbing it the way that I wanted to. So I can't decide if I should continue reading it on ebook or switch to audiobook or just save it for a different time altogether, but it actually inspired me to listen to The School for Scandal in the first place. The Genius of Jane Austen is nonfiction all about how Jane Austen loved the theater, how her work was influenced by theatricals and drama, and why her novels lend themselves to adaptation so well. I only read the first two chapters, titled Private Theatricals and The Professional Theater, but I can tell that this book has so much to offer, and I already have a running list of other plays that I'd like to read or listen to or watch if I can find uh, from the time period. And now onto the things that I watched in July. The first thing that I watched was Rational Creatures Season 2 web series. It's a web series retelling of Persuasion. I actually rewatched season one as well, and then the second newer season, and I absolutely loved it. I thought it was really well done. It follows Anna Elias, who puts others' needs above her own while working for the family business, Kellynch Travel Agency, which is a dead-end job in a failing industry. And then, of course, things get interesting when her high school sweetheart, Fred, comes back into her life. He never went to college and instead has become a rather famous travel writer. So much about this adaptation is well done, especially the way the story has been updated but remains quite similar as well. They did away with the character of Lady Russell, or rather I think that they have a dog named Lady Russell, but it's just a nod to the character. It certainly does not serve the same purpose story-wise. I love how they have flashbacks of Anna and Fred, and I love how Anna gets her own sort of love letter in this adaptation through song. I think it's a really fun and well done modern persuasion adaptation, and one that's definitely worth watching. And then I also watched the 2007 Northanger Abbey movie with J.J. Field as Henry Tilney and Felicity Jones as Catherine Moreland. I love this adaptation. I think J.J. Field is the perfect Henry Tilney, and I really enjoy how we get a glimpse into Catherine Moreland's mind through the imaginative gothic scenes, which then snap back to reality. Though I think that they're really over-sexualized and that that part is kind of unnecessary. They really play up the gothic element of the story in this adaptation through these dream sequences, and also by making General Tilney seem positively villainous. I mean, he's not a great guy, but with those eyebrows he could be almost like a cartoon villain or something. And then the movie makes it seem as though Catherine is turned out of Northanger for her suspicions rather than her marriage prospects. But it still works, plot-wise, I guess. This time watching it, I felt like John Thorpe was depicted as less of a villain than he was in the book. Don't get me wrong, he's still really despicable, but I had an even harsher reaction to reading his character than I did to watching it on the screen this time. I'm not entirely sure why. And then I thought that Mrs. Allen in the movie was less insipid than in the book. As far as Austen adaptations go, this one is great, but I guess I just find myself wanting to read the book again after watching the movie, as is the case with almost all of Austen's adaptations. 
So that is what I read in the month of July. I hope you all had a fantastic Jane Austen July. I would love to know in the comments what was your favorite read or watch of the month. Did you discover anything new this month? And how did your perceptions of old favorites remain the same or change this time around? Until next time, I look forward to seeing you in another bookish video very soon. Bye!